Someone posted this meme saying, when your four score and seven years over, everyone's crap. Whereupon someone else remarked, someone has a time machine, folks. He does kind of look like an unsuccessful police composite drawing of someone trying to describe Abraham Lincoln to the artist and the drawing coming out more like Doc Brown from Back to the Future. According to futurist Richard Florida, what brought America out of the Great Depression was not World War II, as we're always taught in school. It was rather the massive infrastructure spending initiated by Eisenhower in the 1950s when he built the interstate highway system, and subsequently, the suburbs. All that economic activity pulled the country out of the doldrums and set the stage for an age of unprecedented prosperity. Building things helps spur economies. Which is why America suffered after our so-called leaders channeled money away from America to pay for Asia's infrastructure when they absorbed China and the Far East into the Western economic grid. Korea, for instance, according to Ha Jun Chang in his book, Bad Samaritans, had the GDP of Haiti in 1964. After America built it up, subsequent to the Korean War, it now rivals Switzerland in terms of GDP. The same thing with other Asian countries. I mean, we've all seen those pictures of Singapore then versus now, or any other number of Asian capitals. These, especially China, were built up after the West incorporated East Asian labor markets into our economic supply chain. This all came, of course, at the expense of American infrastructure. Catherine Austin Fitz and Professor Mark Skidmore did a forensic accounting of HUD in the Department of Defense and found a staggering $20 trillion embezzled from the U.S. economy. That was just two agencies. When they expanded it across other agencies, it ballooned up to nearly $50 trillion. Where did all that money go? Not to U.S. infrastructure. The Secretary of the Interior gave the United States a D- in terms of our crumbling roads and collapsing bridges. Economists argue that robust investment in infrastructure in the 20th century set the foundation for the nation's strong growth in the aftermath of World War II. And as engineer and historian Henry Petrosky explains it in his book, The Road Taken, The History and Future of America's Infrastructure, poor infrastructure can impose large costs on the U.S. economy. In addition to the threat to human safety of catastrophic failures such as bridge collapses or dam breaches, Inadequately maintained roads, trains, and waterways cost billions of dollars in lost economic productivity. According to Petrosky, the delays caused by traffic congestion alone cost the economy over $120 billion per year. Airports are another choke point. Air transportation services support 1.4 million U.S. jobs, and international tourism brings in hundreds of billions of dollars of tax revenue. But some studies have found that delays in avoided trips due to the poor state of the nation's airports cost the economy over $35 billion per year. Trump complained about it on the campaign trail. We have rebuilt China with the money they've taken out of our country for many years, in all fairness. We have, I call it the greatest single theft in the history of the world, what China has done to our country. You go to China, they have trains that go 300 miles an hour. We have trains that go chug, 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 <laughs> and then they have to stop because the tracks split, right? They have trains that go 300 miles an hour. They have trains, Japan, China, a lot of countries. We have, we're living, we're like third world. We're, you go to our airports, you go to LaGuardia, you land and you go to Dubai, and you go to Qatar, and you go to different places in Asia, and you see airports like you've never seen. Then you come home, you land at Kennedy, you land at LAX, you land at LaGuardia, oh, LaGuardia, <laughs> with the potholes all over the place, okay? I mean, it's, it's just a very sad thing, what's happened. What's happened to our country is very, very, very sad. So where did all the trillions embezzled from the U.S. economy go? To build up Asia, especially China, after they were incorporated into our supply chain after 1990. We closed down all our factories, fired U.S. workers, and replaced them with Asian bonded labor. When this process started, you could get 47 Asian sweatshop workers for the price of one American worker. This was too good to pass up for the globalists. They deindustrialized the United States and created supply chains in Asia. To make it effective, however, they had to beef up their ports, roads, bridges, and canals. This required trillions in capital expenditure. According to William Engdahl, in his book, A Century of War, England did the same thing a hundred years ago. He writes, But behind her apparent status as the world's preeminent power, Britain was rotting internally. The more that British merchant houses extended credit for world trade, and City of London banks funneled loan capital to build railways in Argentina, the United States, and Russia, the more the domestic economic basis of the English nation-state deteriorated. So basically, the British Empire a hundred years ago did the same thing the United States is doing today. It sacrificed its domestic economy for its global empire. Part of this process of globalizing is getting rid of tariffs, which protect domestic industries under the aegis of so-called free trade. 
Tariffs make sure that a tax is placed on foreign items so that they're less competitive with domestic products. A Chinese TV using slave labor can artificially be cheaper than an American TV using ethical labor, so the government can even the playing field by putting a $20 tax on each Chinese unit, making it more expensive than the American TV, thus tilting the bias in favor of the American product. When you remove tariffs, however, you give the slavers the advantage, and this skews the playing field in terms of international markets. This gets you a cheaper TV, true, but at the cost of collapsing domestic industry. You sacrifice your own country for the wider empire. We did a report before on a related phenomenon called Triffin's Dilemma in Economics. This is when the empire that holds the world's reserve currency has to print up enough money to allow for transactions all over the world. Foreign countries are begging America, for instance, to keep printing so that they have less friction in their transactions. For the U.S. to comply with this global demand, it has to hyperinflate its currency, which drives up prices in the homeland. In other words, to benefit the empire, you sacrifice the mother country. Historically, when empires collapse, they sacrifice the colonies before ever imperiling the interior capital. Like frostbite, your body sacrifices the extremities in order to protect the vital internal organs, so you'll lose your fingertips or nose before you ever lose your heart or brain. England and now the United States have reversed this process. To save the empire, they decided to gut their own internal country, in essence sacrificing the heart and brain to protect the fingertips. You allow the homeland to rot as you build out the colonies, essentially causing heart disease to the entire system. If anyone else sees a problem with this backward, short-sighted policy, raise your hand. We need less government, more responsibility, and with God's help, a better world. That's just what the John Birch Society is all about. Check them out at jbs.org.